Praise the Lord, everyone. Let's all stand. We'll go before the Lord in prayer. Start this Sunday school service. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, sweet King, for the opportunity to be in your house, to give you glory, to be in your presence. Oh, I don't ever want to take that for granted, sweet King. Jesus, we pray that you would be the teacher today. Teach us, Lord. Speak to us, Lord. Minister, God. We need you. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Open up your word to us, Jesus, and give us understanding. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This morning, we're going to be studying through the first chapter of first peter and when i start to open up a book of scripture if i want to do a, a verse by verse study i really like to get an idea of what the audience who the audience was who the author was um what we can learn just even from them before we actually delve into the passage so let's talk about just a little bit about peter peter is i have called him and i'm sure others have too called him impetuous <laughs> he speaks and acts first and then he thinks anybody ever do that i have I, I have i have simply acted without thinking it through and then when i'm done sister prayer i'm like oops <laughs> you know how many oops times have there been in peter's life right there's no um there's no middle ground at all with peter he's either on the mountaintop or from zero to 60, he's down in the lowest point of the valley. But the thing about Peter is, even though there's no middle ground, he's an all-in kind of guy. And that's what I appreciate about Peter. You know, think about it. Without a whole lot of thought at all, Peter says, Hey, Jesus, is it you walking on the water? If it is, call me out. And Jesus does, and Peter does. Doesn't even think about it. He's just stepping out and going, and then all of a sudden the realization hits him. <laughs> There's waves around here, and he fails, and then Jesus picks him up. When the soldiers come to arrest Jesus in the garden, Peter, again, without thinking, he's trying to protect his, his master. He takes a sword and slices off the ear of Malchus. When Jesus tells Peter that Peter would deny him three times. Peter's like, ain't no way that's going to happen. But just as strongly as Peter tells Jesus he wouldn't do it, he did it. This is Peter. But then we get to after the resurrection. Peter was restored. Peter had amazing revelation. He was given the keys to the kingdom. But what I love is that regardless of all the mess-ups... <laughs> Jesus still used Peter to preach that very first message to the church. Y'all, that gives me hope. Because <laughs> I mess up a plenty. But if God can use somebody that messes up like Peter, surely he can use me and you. Peter also got to officially open the doors of the church to the Gentiles. This is an amazing man, regardless of his just crazy, wild mentality but you know if you start to compare peter to the rest of the disciples let's be honest peter's probably not the one that you and i would have chosen to lead them and yet because of peter's all-in character that's what made him stand out that's what made him a leader and that was the man that jesus chose to lead his people and that is the man that wrote first peter 1 Peter 1, verse 1, and Sister Roman, I'm just going to go through these just a couple verses at a time. 1 Peter 1 and 1 says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. If Pastor Romine sends you a letter, not that he would, but he might, or sends you a text, would you deem that as important? absolutely you would because he's our leader he's our pastor and because things that come from our leaders have weight we would pay extra attention to that imagine the importance of this letter first peter 
to the readers. It was coming from the head honcho of the church. So it has a lot of weight, has a lot of meaning. In Peter's introduction, he simply says that he's the Peter that is an apostle of Jesus Christ. And in that simple phrase, Sister Carrie, Peter acknowledges his position in the kingdom and why he's even writing this letter. Peter's sending the letter because, you ready for this? He is completely sold out to Jesus. Why do you and I do the things that we do? Why do we not do some of the things that we intentionally not do? What is our motivation? Are you and I just as sold out to Jesus as Peter was? Peter was an all-in guy. Are we all in for the kingdom? That's a, that's a convicting question. Are we all in? Moving on, Peter wrote the letter to strangers, or it, it could be translated pilgrims, not the ones that came from England, but temporary residents in a foreign land. That's who he was writing to. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. We're pilgrims. We're strangers. This world is not our final home. It's not. I got to celebrate a homegoing of a dear, precious friend of mine yesterday. He's with the Lord. That's the end game. That's the end game. Peter wrote to Gentile Christians who've been scattered abroad not to one specific church, but to the church as a whole. And so because of that, we can take what Peter wrote and apply it to ourselves. Verse 2 says, Elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Peter addresses his audience. Now first he describes them as being elect or chosen by God. I got to thinking about this. Do, do we grasp that God has handpicked us for his kingdom? It's not just random that we're sitting here in this sanctuary this morning. We are literally handpicked, Sister Blake, by God and not just here and now but y'all before we were born we were handpicked by God to be in his kingdom that blows my mind how does one become then elect because it doesn't sound like we have a whole lot of choice does it if God handpicks us before we were born does God just randomly pick people and say, you're going to heaven, you're going to hell? He doesn't do that. For God so loved the world. Not just a pick, just, just a few that he handpicked. He loves the world. You see, God chose the whole world and leaves the rest of the choice up to us. We were chosen before we were formed in the womb. Yes, for sure. God knew for sure what our choice eventually was going to be, but he leaves that choice up to us. We are elect through the sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience. When we obey the gospel, when we repent of our sins, when we are baptized in the beautiful name of Jesus, when we are filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues, we become a part of the elect. God wants that for everybody. We've just got to choose it for ourselves. And so because of that, let me just give you a quick side note. Beware of the doctrine of, that some denominations teach that they say that God alone decides where you're going, whether you're going to be saved or not. That's not biblical. You and I cho choose to serve the Lord. Peter also talks about the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus 
Blood in the Old Testament was sprinkled on three different occasions. First, to establish a covenant made between God and Israel at Mount Sinai. Sinai. Blood was sprinkled to ordain the priest for service, and blood was sprinkled when a leper was cleansed of his disease. Going back to that thought of covenant and Mount Sinai, when Jesus talks about us being sprinkled by his blood, He's talking about bringing us into covenant relationship with him. We get to walk, Sister Carrie, in relationship with Jesus. Oh, because of his blood. As Peter goes on, you can almost hear excitement in his voice. He's saying things like, you awesome, blessed, holy, sanctified, righteous people. God give you grace and peace. Anybody here ever always feel holy and sanctified and righteous? (laughs) Can I crawl under a rock? I don't always feel holy and sanctified and righteous. But oh, the blood of Jesus, Brother Pruitt, that cleanses us. Mm. God makes us righteous with his blood. I'm so grateful. But it is to those people that Peter says, God give you grace and peace. Anybody need grace and peace? Every single moment of every single day, I need him. Verses 4 and 5. I'm not even sure I'm going to finish this today. Well, I'll get through as much as I can. Verses 4 and 5. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, And that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You see, Peter tells the saints, and that includes you and me, that our salvation is incorruptible. Nothing can destroy that salvation inheritance. Money will lose its value. Houses, lands, possessions will eventually fade away, but salvation in the name of Jesus doesn't diminish at all. And it cannot be spoiled. It cannot be turned rotten. Thank you, Jesus, that his salvation is established. Oh, y'all, that is hope to me. Then, as if it wasn't enough, Peter begins to talk about the power of God. God's power is keeping power. I love this thought that God's arms, Brother Plunkett, don't grow tired holding us. God doesn't grow weary leading and guiding us in this journey. He has more than enough power to keep each one of us until the end of time. And y'all, that's the end game. And according to scripture, there is plenty of evidence that he will keep you and me in his arms. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Verse 6. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. We can rejoice in our salvation even in the middle of our trials because salvation gives us hope and it doesn't change. Whether we're on the top of the mountain or we are deep down in the valley, salvation doesn't change, y'all. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Remember, trials are temporary. You know, when you're smack dab in the middle of a difficulty, it is not always easy to remember that this is just a temporary time. Anybody ever been there, done that? I could raise both hands and both feet on that one. But Peter, in verse 6, acknowledges that trials are hard. Y'all... We don't have to be Superman or Superwoman all the time. I'm so grateful for that, Brother Plunkett, because I can be pretty stubborn and proud, and I know this, because I'm Sister Jan, I can do it. But we don't really have to be that way. 
Thank God for good friends in difficulties. We're human. But there's hope, even in the middle of our trouble. And this is verse 7. This is awesome. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Y'all, God's purpose in allowing trials to come into our life is not to prove to him how great our faith is. It's to show us where our faith is. God already knows how strong or how weak we are. So when God chooses to test us, when he allows trials to come into our lives, it's really about bringing glory to God because he's going to work some things in us and through us in the middle of those trials. And that's why Peter said that those trials can bring forth gold, <laughs> more precious than gold. Charles Spurgeon said, Indeed, it is the honor of faith to be tried. Shall any man say, I have faith, but I have never had to believe under difficulties who knows whether thou hast any faith shall a man say i have great faith in god but i have never had to use it in anything more than the ordinary affairs of life where i could possibly have done without it as well as with it is this to the honor and praise of your faith do you think that such a faith as this will bring any great glory to god or bring to thee any great reward if so you're mistaken that's pretty tough stuff, isn't it? But here's what Spurgeon was saying. Faith is tested to show that it's sincere. Faith is tested to show the strength of the faith. And faith is tested to show and purify it. Like the burning away of dross. Have you ever been through a trial when it was over? You look back, Sister Blake, and go, boy, I really messed up on that one. And then you got to go before the Lord and say, okay, I need some help. I really don't want to go through this trial or test again. Can you help me grow from this? And that makes your faith even stronger. It's worth it, even the trials. Verse 8, whom having not seen you love and whom though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of of glory real faith real faith is believing in and loving jesus even when we cannot see him even when i don't see it he's working even when i don't feel it he's working he never stops never stops a rejoicing in his faithfulness is filled with abundant joy When's the last time, this is not in my notes, when's the last time we spent time enough in the presence of the Lord to be filled with his joy? We can come before the Lord with our problems and with our tests and with our trials, and that's okay. That's exactly what we're supposed to do. But when's the last time we spent enough time in prayer that we felt the joy of the Holy Ghost, even in the middle of all of our trials, giving us strength to go through the trial. I need that. We need that. When we're smack dab in the middle of difficulties, y'all, the best thing you can do, reach out to your friends, have them pray for you. I can't tell you the people I reached out to the last um, couple of days saying, pray for me, I need, I need prayer right now. Um, have people pray for you but man you got to get into prayer yourself until you feel the anointing and the peace and the grace and the joy of the holy ghost for yourself get into his presence and then allow that joy the joy of the lord is our strength verse 9 receiving the end of your faith even the salvation of your souls. I'm talking this morning about the end game. The end result of our faith is ultimate and final salvation. When we finally see Jesus face to face 
and get to live with him for eternity. That's the end game. And Brother Plunkett, your cousin, my amazing friend, has met the end of his game. He has seen Jesus face to face. I'm grateful. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. I can't wait to see Jesus face to face. Verses 10 through 12. And I'm just giving up getting through this whole lesson. (laughs) Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Peter keeps talking about our blessed salvation for here and for eternity and says, hey, this doctrine ain't something new. Salvation's been preached. The Old Testament prophesied that a Messiah would come and would save us. Imagine Can you imagine having been Isaiah and seeing the salvation of the Lord in a vision? Can you imagine what it must have been like for prophets like Zechariah, Amos, Micah, and Jeremiah to see visions of what was coming? And you and I get to experience the very things that they saw. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Then Peter sums all that up and says, angels desire to look into this salvation. Jesus said in Luke 15, verses 7 and 10, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. I get excited thinking about when somebody comes to this altar. And they lay their lives down at this altar. And they are baptized in the beautiful name of Jesus. Do you know that that strikes a party in heaven? This ain't just some little thing that we see and we get excited. All of heaven rejoices when just one sinner comes to repentance. They desire to be so much a part of what God is doing on earth here in us mere mortals that they throw a party. Can't we do the same? Can't we rejoice? We focus so much, and I get it, I understand. We focus so much when somebody speaks in tongues and they're filled with the Holy Ghost, and that's amazing, and we should rejoice with that. But we should rejoice just as much when somebody realizes how much of a sinner that they really are, and they come to an altar, and they kneel down. Oh, I'm feeling like, oh, Jesus. And they kneel down at an altar, and they begin to say, oh, God, I need you. Y'all, we should rejoice at that as much as we rejoice at that as much as we rejoice at them speaking in tongues because y'all there's a party going on in heaven when's the last time we rejoiced over somebody repenting I triple dog dare you to not wait until somebody is filled with the Holy Ghost before you rejoice over what God is doing in their life Man, I feel the unction of the Holy Ghost in that. Somebody hear me. Don't wait to rejoice until they're talking in tongues. Rejoice when they repent because that means God is beginning a good work in their lives. We should rejoice at the hand of God on that. I better calm down. It ain't me preaching today. Rejoice when you see God working. 2 Corinthians 10.5. Well, let me go back. I'm sorry. Uh, verse 13 of 1 Peter 1. I was getting ahead of myself. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. 
be sober and hope unto the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter says, thinking about all of this, here's what you need to do. Gird up the loins of your mind. To do that really means getting rid of loose and sloppy thinking. To bring the rational and reflective powers of your mind under control. What does that mean? It means to control what you think about. It means to decide what you set your mind upon. That also means that you and I need to put on the helmet of salvation. Brother Plunkett, when I find my mind going off, and it does quite often, when I find my mind trailing off into things that it ought not to, that's when, when the Holy Ghost finally nudges me and gets through my thick brain, <laughs> that I finally start praying, oh God, cover me with your salvation. Cover my mind with your salvation. Cover my ears, God, that I hear the right thing. Cover my eyes, God, that I see the right thing. We need that. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and, bringeth, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Strongholds, Brother Plunkett preaches this so hard, so strong, and it needs to be. Strongholds are thought processes that do not please the Lord. Paul says, cast these down. Peter says, rein these in. We must take control over our thoughts. Philippians 4.8 says, finally, brethren, if you don't know what to think about, Go to Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. So when our minds begin to wander down a path that we know that it should not, take control. I want strongholds in my mind to be broken. I want strongholds in our thoughts. I feel the Holy Ghost to be torn down. So the old ways of thinking that keep us bound up can be broken so that you and I can be set free by girding up the loins of our mind. Peter says to be sober, looking at this life seriously, be self-disciplined. Eternity rests on how we handle this life. Now, I'm not saying going around and not smiling, not laughing. That's not what I mean. I mean understanding the seriousness of eternity and keeping that in our hearts. Eternity is serious business. But Peter then says there's hope. So hang on to that hope. Our hope isn't some wishy-washy thing going on. Our faith is certain and there is grace in the midst of all of that. Grace is the unmerited love of God stopping to save and bless the source of all those bright and holy gifts which come from God's infinite heart. You and I receive grace when we are saved. We live with the grace of God upon our lives right now and God's grace will get us through and to the end game. going to wrap up by the by verses 14 15 and 16 this morning because if I go to my the end of my notes I would no we'll be here too long but verses 14 through 16 says as obedient children not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance but as he which hath called you is holy so be ye holy in all manner of conversation because it is written be ye holy for I am holy in other words don't continue to live act talk dress like you did before you were saved live in accordance with God's holy word his word calls us to be set apart from others we're to be more like him and less like this world you see, holiness is not so much 
something we possess as it is something that possesses us. Because when we are filled with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God, we are made holy in and out. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 says, Peter, or Paul says, not as though I'd already attained, either were already perfect. Anybody perfect in here? But, Paul says, I follow after that if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. In other words, this is how I'm going to end today, if you'll stand with me. God's gotten a hold of us, now let's get a hold of him. Getting a hold of God, being holy like him, cannot be done in our own power or in our own strength. But when we are filled with his spirit, you and I have the power to become more and more and more like Jesus. There's times that I'll, I'll be in prayer and I'll just think, God, all I want is more of you. That's just, I, that's just been my prayer like the, from the beginning of the year. Jesus, I just, I just want more of you. God, I just want to be more like you. I know I've got a really long way, but I just, I just want more and more of you. And, and then I find myself singing a song like, more of you. All I want is more of you. I want more of Jesus. Having more and more of him on a day-to-day -day basis, Sister Carrie, is what is going to get us to that end game. So that we can see Jesus face to face. We can walk with him now and have that blessed assurance. Let's pray. Jesus, I'm so thankful for your word. I'm so thankful for your anointing and your power and your presence. Thank you, God for your sweet spirit that fills us, that keeps us, that anoints us. Jesus, I pray that we would keep our eyes and our minds on you, that we would seek to be more and more like you, that we would sense your holiness being poured out upon us, God, in and out, Jesus, so that our words become more like your words, that our, our actions become more like your actions, our, our deeds become more like your deeds, the choices that we make become more like your choices. Oh, God, I pray your holiness upon this precious congregation. God, help us to be more and more and more like you. Jesus, I pray so often that I need you. I need you. I need you, Jesus. And I want to be more and more like you. Settle your anointing upon your people today. Settle your anointing upon our pastor today. Oh, God, that you would be glorified and that you would be magnified in the worship service as we go in. Jesus, that there would be a rejoicing that happens in heaven today. God, as we seek your praise as we seek your presence, be magnified, Jesus. May your name be glorified, and we'll love you, and we'll thank you for it all. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. You're dismissed. Let's get ready for worship service. Thank you, Jesus.